I prepared myself while I was in prison and I got uh, uh, plenty of exercise because when I came out, I did a lot of walking. came into this ravine. I looked down in there and I said, this is the place. Set up my tent, spent the next 34 days camping out in that ravine. My housing options were basically living rough. colleague from Weber County. Um, we have been working together on the Good Landlord Program and some revisions. One of the aspects of that that has caused heartburn for some uh, in the uh, Department of Corrections, in the housing community, uh, in the, uh, there are a number of other communities that are concerned about the extent to which, under current law, uh, cities have the ability to put in place as a requirement to participate in the Good Landlord Program uh, penalties on landlords who lease or rent to individuals who have been convicted of certain crimes within the last four years. There's been a lot of controversy surrounding the felony exclusion. My name is Tom Wood. Uh, I run the Good Landlord Program. Uh, I teach good landlord training classes for the cities throughout Utah that have good landlord classes. When it was first introduced in Ogden, there was a lot of pushback against that. Uh, other cities kind of followed the Ogden model. The first thing that the good landlord program requires of landlords is to run a background check on all of their applicants. I don't know you at all. And so I'm going to run a background check and I'm going to look at it and go, hey, you're fabulous. There's nothing wrong here. You're a great credit risk. I got a good recommendation from your past landlord. You haven't got any sort of criminal record. Come on in. Now, in all cities except Salt Lake and South Salt Lake, they have felony exclusions, which means that you can't rent to anyone who has a felony conviction in the last four years. When you have someone move in next door to you and you find out that they're an ex-con and you've got two little girls aged three and five, you're going to move. And again, as a landlord, I'm losing business because I'm renting to someone with a, a felony conviction. They may be a great person, but that doesn't change the fact that the neighbor is scared and the neighbor's gonna go somewhere else. My name's Michael McCanch and um, I'm living here in Salt Lake City now after uh, doing 15 years in prison for a sex offense. Coming out of prison, you've got a lot of adjustments you gotta make and um, people don't understand. It's very difficult for felons and especially sex offenders to find housing. So my game plan was to look for alternative housing. 
wasn't going to uh, go from apartment complex to apartment complex and get the door slammed in my face. I was getting up before dawn and making my breakfast and um, uh, making coffee and um, going out to uh, getting on the tracks and uh, going into the city. A lot of sex offenders become homeless when they come out of prison and jail for a number of different reasons, one of which, and the most major, is the stigma attached to being a sex offender. So the public often misunderstands that sex offenders don't actually reoffend as often as you'd think they would. Part of the reason that landlords probably don't want to rent, besides the stigma and the misunderstandings, is liability. They think that if, if I rent to a sex offender who's been identified as a sex offender and then they do it again, that's going to look bad for me. The other issue they have when they come out is all of the laws and policies that make it harder for them to find housing. So things like residence restrictions make it so that they can only live in certain very small areas and in some places nowhere at all. So you see in San Francisco, they can't live anywhere. Uh, same thing in Miami, there's, there's very few places that they can actually live. I'm not mad at anybody, really. I um, uh, don't want to really place blame. Um, I am uh, understand uh, the public's um, uh, feelings about sex offenders. I feel if somebody is given a second chance and they blow it, they commit another offense, that should be it. But everybody deserves a second chance. When you hear no, no, no over again based off of something that you did four years ago, it doesn't really give you much hope to do different. And I don't want us to be who we were four years ago. I want us to be better. And there's days where it's hard. mother of two little girls, five and three, uh, married to James. We live in Riverdale. We're good people, trying to be good parents. We weren't doing what we should have been doing. Uh, we wanted to spend a night in a motel room getting high because we didn't want to do it at our house. We were trying to be as smart about it as possible as you can be, trying to do some stupid decision. We didn't have our kids. We took them to um, a daycare for the night just so we could have a night and everything. We picked up probably a tea, a dope, and some weed, and then went to the hotel room and just smoked. The Riverdale City Police called up the hotel room because they were doing a warrant check on the whole hotel that night and called up to our room because my wife had had a warrant at the time. And before they would release my belongings to my husband, they said that they needed to run his name. Well, our meth was in the cigarette pack and with, with the weed, and um, they tried to give the charge to my wife because it was in her hands first, and I took the charge. He took the cigarette pack from me when he knew that he was gonna get arrested. He didn't want me to be stuck with the felony because he knew the repercussions of a felony. We have lived here for two years. Um, his mom actually bought the trailer and we knew the previous manager and so the manager let her not put us on the lease. So they didn't, didn't know. Um, they recently became under new management and the manager's requiring us to apply to be put on the lease and because of his felony, we can't. So we have until April 1st to get our shit and get out. The reason I ask is just because he is um, on probation currently from a uh, felony from 2012 that uh -huh. will be reduced to a class A misdemeanor in December. 
And so the reason why I just asked that firsthand is just because everybody else, if you're part of the Good Landlord program, they won't rent to you if you're a felon. So. Yeah. What, what was the uh, What was the uh, charges? Uh, the The charge was possession of a controlled substance. Okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, we still use Western reporting. Mm-hmm. And that would that would still come up and would uh, would disqualify him. You know, I did put myself in this situation. I take full responsibility for it. I'm not denying anything that happened when I got the felony. It sucks for my kids because they have to go through the struggle and don't understand why. And that's what hurts the most, really. I, I carry a lot of guilt from that day and I just I try to I try to stay strong and I try to stay positive and try to keep him positive. But if he was on his own he he would have killed himself. He he, he would have killed himself. Landlord programs are city level programs that different cities, municipalities in Utah use ostensibly to help clean up crime free areas. There are about 14 cities along the Wasatch Front that use good landlord programs. And one of the one of the common aspects of the program in most of the cities along the Wasatch Front is that landlords are required not rent to tenants who have a recent criminal conviction. Probation and parole officers who are interested in actually helping get people off probation and parole, they have informed us that programs like the Good Landlord Program, when there's 50% of rental properties participating or two thirds of rental properties participating, which is the case in Ogden, that they have a really hard time finding safe, stable housing for people with recent criminal convictions. If you put barriers in place to individuals having a safe, affordable place to live when they come out of prison and jail, you're going to put them at greater risk to going right back where they did have safe, mm -hmm. and from their perspective, affordable housing. We don't want government interfering with uh, the process by which individuals just in a private market they make decisions about whether they provide their goods or their services to people. But when you put in place a government penalty that really says we're going to make sure you don't rent to these folks because if you do you're going to pay us money at the city of whatever. That's a problem and uh, it is government micromanagement and it is interference with decisions that individuals should be free to make in their own private lives. The days of being able to use somebody's criminal conviction or even arrest or criminal charge as a proxy for actual criminality, those days are just gone. It's not, it's not a correlation that you, can, that you can trust anymore. I came out of prison. I had no intention of living in a traditional apartment. I felt, OK. I'm not going to knock my head against a brick wall trying to break through it. I'm going to go around that brick wall. I had no idea where I was going to go except I knew that I was going to head towards the nearest mountains. My support system while I got out um, was uh, pretty much the uh, president of UPAN, Molly Prince. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and my private practice, I work with primarily convicted sex offenders and have done so for the past 20 years. Well, I first heard from Michael a few years ago um, when we first started Utah Prisoner Advocate Network. And he had contacted me via letter from prison saying that he was going to expire his 15-year sentence. And he had asked if I would be willing to be the recipient of his social security card and some funds he was sending out in order to be prepared to get out. So I said, yes, I would do that. The day I was released was a Sunday, um, July 19th. We went that Sunday morning and um, 
checked in and waited for them to bring Mike out, which is the first time we ever met him. Hi, I'm Molly. Yes. This is Lacey. Oh, Lacey, good to meet you. We get in the car and I notice he's just trembling. He was just high anxiety and he's looking around at everything and he's talking a mile a minute. I had no way of knowing how normal this was for him, but I knew he had to be terrified and exhilarated at the same time. I pulled over at a spot that had a little bit of grass and some trees and I said, come on Mike, let's, let's get out of the car. I wanted him just to like stand on some grass and ground himself. And so we stood under a tree on some grass and I looked to the east and I said, okay, there are the mountains. Just take a deep breath. Don't say a word, just. Just, just ground yourself in, and be here for a minute. And I don't know if he thought I was crazy or not, but he tried to do it. So we got back in the car and we were talking about where was I going to take him? And he said, I want to go to a Walmart because I want to get some things and then I want to go and enjoy nature. And we pulled into the Walmart parking lot and we got out and there was a basket and I had fixed a little backpack for him that had some hygiene items in it, you know. We're standing there in this parking lot with him packing his stuff in this grocery basket, you know, packing these bags. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to leave this man. I made sure that he had my phone number and my information and I asked him to please make sure he stayed in contact. And he was very interested in, I want to help with Utah Prisoner Advocate Network and things like that. Um, and so finally, we shook hands. I don't remember if we hugged or not. I know that he shook hands with my husband and, and I got in the car with my husband and left and I just cried as we left because it just seemed so sad to have someone get out of prison after 15 years and really have nowhere to go. I went in, in a daze. It was kind of like being in a dream state for a while, walking around the aisles. And um, then it, I, it fin I finally woke up to the, um, that uh, if I didn't get going and, and buying up what I needed, that I would be in that uh, store uh, much too long and wouldn't have time to find a place to camp for the night. He'd been dreaming about sleeping under the stars and laying on the earth, being out of concrete and steel. So I took the um, red tracks line mm -hmm. out. Uh, I figured I'd take it as far as it went. And he stayed in touch and he let me know that he set up a regular camp. On Pioneer Day, the 24th. In a ravine farther south and west. There were deer in the uh, ravine and uh, there were all kinds of bird life. It beat being in the uh, homeless shelter by a mile. What we need to do to change the system is uh, change our attitudes. We've gotten really mean-spirited in this country uh, in the last 20 years. We have this um, fear of strangers, but oftentimes it's not the stranger that is going to um, hurt you. In my case, um, uh, my offense was committed against people that I knew. So another piece of this is when someone's been in prison for 15 years and they can only make 40 cents an hour, 60 cents an hour, they don't have a lot of money when they get out. Even if there was somewhere that's more than willing to rent to them, they don't always have a lot of money. My name is Tanya. I'm a mom of four kids. Uh, wonderful kids, and I have a felony from almost 30 years ago, and it has uh, been a problem and prevented me from getting uh, adequate, uh, reasonable 
uh, accessible housing for me. There's no excuse to commit a crime, but there's reasons, and there was a lot of reasons behind a lot of emotional uh, reasons why for my actions. I almost lost my home, I almost lost my kids, I almost lost everything. I uh, did go to a theft program that was very, very helpful. I, with the grace of God and with good behavior, I only did 30 days, but that was enough to uh, scare me straight. Okay, now the, the very first one just says that I'm denied because of my credit, my lack of credit, and my criminal background did not meet their criteria. I've, um, I've made four attempts to write letters to the uh, CEO, and each time she has stated that she cannot override the felony charge. As stated in my previous letters, I have upheld rejection of your application due to your background and credit history according to our policies. And I said, uh, what, what about my background? Well, you have a felony. And I went into kind of a panic. While I sympathize with your situation and would love to have you as a resident at the station, I cannot override the rejection of your application. But wait a minute, that's it's from 27 years ago and it was just for petty theft. It wasn't even a, a big crime. And she said, well, when it comes to felonies, they won't budge on that. Until expungement of the felony goes through, we have, and we have document, and the felony no longer shows on your background, you will not qualify. Well, there, there's several reasons why I am trying so hard to, for this. I need to have a handicap accessible, a wheelchair accessible, so there's no stairs. There's no one above and no one below. There's just one level. But they have nice garages. There's always been a problem with uh, going to and from my car. I've had several falls in the wintertime here. It saddens me that I've had to go through all this, and I, but then again, it makes me want to not give up. Because I haven't been able to get a straight answer if this particular place I'm trying to get into has this good landlord or whatever felon fee zone. It may be true that, you know, when you, when you reduce the number of individuals who are uh, more likely to commit crime, when you reduce the number of those individuals in a particular city, crime rates go down. But the reality is that those individuals don't disappear. They go someplace. So you're just moving the problem from one place to another. And that's not a good solution. They're most vulnerable to going back to prison and jail because they can't find work and they can't find a safe, affordable place to live. I don't think coerce is too strong a word. I think that it is coerce. It's saying you will refuse to, to lease or rent your property to these individuals who have recently gotten out of jail or prison, and if you don't, you'll pay a hefty price. This is not a small penalty in many situations. Because if you're part of the Guglielmo program, it's $12 or $13 for a unit or a duplex, depending what you have. If you're not part of the Guglielmo program, it's over $100 per unit, you gotta pay for a business license. So that's kind of been the controversy as well. Yeah, I mean, and, and that, uh, as owners, that makes the owners kind of upset, because it's like, why am I paying for a license? What it does do is it creates very coercive business licensing fees, much higher fees for landlords that don't agree to the terms of the city. So at the end of the day, I would favor an approach where landlords get to choose who they want to rent to. But the city says, you rent to the type of people that we say you can rent to, otherwise you pay a much higher business license fee. We're gonna charge you these higher fees for your rental properties because we think the people that live there are calling for city services more than everybody else. But if you participate in a good landlord program and follow all these different rules, you can get a substantial discount on those fees. Uh, the landlords don't wanna pay the money and they 
they feel like the city's forcing them to become educated. Um, I have been a landlord for 25 years. I have been in your shoes. Some of you in here have worked for me in the past. If I don't want to rent to a felon, I won't rent to a felon. But I like to have the freedom to rent to one if I want to. If I want to rent to my nephew, who's kind of an idiot and has a felony conviction from about two and a half years ago, it seems like I ought to be able to rent to him if I want to, because he's not much of a risk for me. And so I like the uh, ability to rent to them if I want to. And if I don't want to, the city's not gonna force me and say, well, you have to, I get to choose. I like having that choice personally. I've actually been working with the Utah Housing Coalition on trying to develop a program where we can go to prisons and teach felons before they're released, have them go through a training class where they can become certified as a good tenant. They can then take that certification and uh, get an exemption from cities with the felony restrictions. We still can't make any kind of uh, requirement for private companies or private individuals that simply say, we have no intention of renting to someone with a felony conviction, but we're proposing something that this would allow you to rent to someone and not be in violation of a good landlord program. But I, I think it's probably good to have the landlord have that discretion. As long as you have the information available, to be able to see what those felonies are. You know, if, if, if all you know is that someone committed a third degree felony and you don't have the ability to look into what it was or when it was or what happened, then you, know, uh, you probably don't want to rent to that person. To me, people look at my felony charge like I can never come back from it, um, that I could never get sober, that um, basically, I wasn't worth the time of fucking day. It's, it's just been hard because it, my husband uh, is the only one that has, you know, is the only one that's working and I'm, you know, staying home with our two kids. So it's, okay. it, it's just, it's been a mess for us. But, um, yeah. well, thank you for getting back with me. And... Oh, no problem. I'm sorry I couldn't help you better, but, uh, you know, we have to maintain the same standards for everybody. Oh, it's no problem. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. It's not the same standards for everybody. Because he completely contradicted himself. At first it was, oh, we don't participate in the Good Landlord Program. Wait, what was his charge for? Possession of a controlled substance. Oh, wait, no because then that'll come back on his credit report and it will still show up and it, it's horseshit. But just tell me no. I mean, hell, it's almost like a Vietnam flashback, getting out of jail, you know? Uh, it's like, I don't even want to try. I just want to let God take the wheel and maybe drive me off a cliff or something, so. It's not about um, giving us repercussions for what we did. We completely accept what we did. The problem is we shouldn't be forced to have to live with it over our heads for the, our entire lives. We're sober, we're, he's working two jobs, we're taking damn good care of our kids. We just want to do better than we're doing. We don't want to be stuck anymore. I'm scared uh, how it's going to affect my kids when they get older. I, I, I worry about that every single day. Real quick, do you it is to know that? 581 Maple Street. Oh, Maple Street, yes. That's a two bedroom, one bath, 950. That's awesome. Um, I was wondering if uh, you guys are part of the Good Landlord program. We are. You are? Okay. Um, do you guys uh, do the felony exclusions? The felony has to be at least four years old. Mm hmm. And they have to be completely on paper, on parole or probation. Okay, thank you.
yeah, I'll try and call him one more time and then uh, I guess I'll just leave him another message and just let him know that we were here and um, trying to see it and just see if he'll call us back. Okay. All right, baby. Well, if nothing else, I'll see you soon. Absolutely. I love you. I love you. I was 18 when it happened. I was 20 when I was convicted, but a friend and I worked the overnight shift at the Jack in the Box, and we both decided, hey, I'm not going to tell, you're not going to tell, and we just had this bright idea to pretend like we got robbed, and he told, and it was stupid, and I've been paying for it ever since. At the time, I had actually been charged with two things. Um, the other one was aggravated second-degree battery because my boyfriend had beat somebody up, and I wasn't going to tell on him. And so they charged me with it too. And so I had to plead this nonviolent one to get them to drop the violent one. That's why I have a felony for my first, very first offense. What, what do you think in society in general, what do you think people think of when they hear the word felon, ex-felon? I think they think something horrible, something violent, or just bad, you know, like bad seed, not like, you know, bad person, but just something's like seriously wrong with you. People need to be more open-minded. And, well, maybe not open-minded, but more accepting, like, people fuck up, everybody fucks up. And I don't think that I should have to pay for it for the rest of my life. And if that was the case, I'd still be in jail. My self-esteem and my personal self has gotten a lot better, but it's brought, it's brought me down to where I almost wanted to go to a therapist to help me with uh, retaining my self-worth. I, I am not a hardened criminal. Being rejected by society, being rejected by the Good Landlord Act or by employers, it hurts inside to the point where you want to look outside. And a lot of times that outside support isn't the type of support you need. It breaks down their sense of worth. Um, it ostracizes them from the community. I've been doing research on ostracism uh, for over 22 years now, and uh, I'm interested in basically how does a person who is being ignored and excluded, which is how I define ostracism, how does that person feel, how do they think, how do they behave. Another group of people who probably face a fair amount of ostracism would be people getting out of prison, who have been in prison for a long time. Uh, their records stay with them, employers might shun them or avoid them, uh, communities might uh, shun them and avoid them, uh, they're even their, perhaps their former friends and family. Do you have an ostracism condition? Do you um, know No, this, I think this is inclusion. I don't have an ostracism one quite ready to go. Okay. So do you think it's going to affect the actual experience of it as it's happening, what we usually call the reflexive stage, or do you think this is going to be something that affects uh, a delayed response? And if every day you're ostracized regardless of what you do, then you finally tend to give up. And so this stage is called the resignation stage. And for people who have to endure daily and weekly and monthly and yearly ostracism. We can suffer, suffer psychologically and physically. They're going to start to feel lonely, perhaps alienated from either a group of people or maybe even society broadly. Some of the interview data that I've seen uh, suggest that people start to uh, become more aggressive, um, not just sort of uh, maybe verbally, but even physically, face uh, ostracism or exclusion in different ways. Uh, so a lot of research on, on stigmatization uh, comes from uh, areas like sociology, uh, where they look at sort of um, the, the cultural or, or group level uh, ways of excluding people, like moving them into different neighborhoods, uh, excluding them from uh, getting housing at all. Right? So that there are different uh, sort of systemic ways, as well as in a personal ways, to exclude. Uh, someone who has a, a criminal background. And so these people uh, have, face a, a very difficult uh, prospect of trying to uh, reintegrate themselves in the community, uh, to be re-included, 
and if they continue to be ostracized after getting out of prison, then uh, they may resort to these unhealthy types of reactions. Represent Briscoe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a meeting tonight at 7.30 with two women who got out of prison in May working on some housing issues. And we get frustrated when we have people go back to prison quickly after getting out of prison. But when they get out of prison and a very large percentage of property owners say, Mark here whether you have a felony, and you have a felony, and they won't even take your application. How are we to help these people get back on their feet? How are we to help them make it back in? The woman I'm meeting with tonight spent a lot of time in lockup in solitary confinement where she got out to go to the bathroom. She got a half an hour a day for a year, and then we let her out of prison, and then we expect them to just kind of make it in society. Good Landlord was uh, an opportunity to, cho to do a couple things. Number one, try and help uh, landlords to become more professional in what they, uh, in running their business. Um, the second was to try and control um, some of the population um, that was coming out of the halfway house and other places because um, they were all con uh, congregating in one geographic area. So we put together a program where it required training every other year. Um, we assigned that or gave the, the rights to that to the apartment association to do that training. We built this program for us. This was an Ogden program built by Ogden people for Ogden. What happened as a result of it is it started duplicating all over the state. Um, as a result, I think, of it duplicating so much, then I think the legislature started to get uneasy and um, the ACLU uh, was uneasy with the practice. Um, they liked the program except for the felony exclusion. What we decided after a, a number of meetings that it was best to conduct a pilot program with adult probation and parole, let them come in and determine the best way to to decide how we integrate these felons back into the local communities. The concept that we're looking at is, is that they have a list, um, the parolee goes out and has to find uh, a place to live, uh, they'll get an address, they would go back and clear it with their parole officer, parole officer would check the list and say, no, you can't live there, we'll go find another place. And so we would be working on those addresses to kind of keep um, a lot of high risk uh, parolees from living so close together. Paul Smith uh, obviously represents a good good association, a good segment of our of our housing industry. So they're they're in full support of the pilot program. They they think very similar to I do that we just need to make sure that 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 housing stock is not concentrated in small areas. We tend to like to think that we can, in our society, that we can identify who's a criminal and get them out of our communities, and then that will make us all safe. But really, criminals and sex offenders, it's everybody. It's people that you know. It's community members are sex offenders. Land, what landlords should know is that they're people. That's the number one thing that I see is that, especially with sex offenders, people start talking about sex offenders as if they're not people and they're people. By not renting to them in some situations, you're making the problem worse because where are they gonna go? If they can't go anywhere and they become homeless. He was living in a tent at daybreak um, and he told me that he wanted to get out of you know homelessness and this might be his way out. So he came in here and it worked out that we had a room for him and it it's totally changed his life. He is, he's been a really good tenant here, really good tenant, and, and uh, works with us, works really close, is very involved in the self-reliance classes and attends them all. He helps others along the road. He gives a lot of advice to people coming out of halfway houses. And I just got out of prison in July of last year, and I sent a letter to Representative King about some of the problems. 
Representative King called me up and we talked on the phone for about 40 minutes, I think it was, about the problems. He, done his, he did his homework. Stigmatized populations have difficulty getting legislative resources allocated to them. I'm talking about homeless people. I'm talking about people who suffer from mental illness that's serious. I'm talking about people who are uh, substance abusers. I'm talking about sex offenders. I'm talking about prison populations more generally. These are unsympathetic populations. I wish that more of my colleagues up there, not, to me, not that I'm judging them, because I'm not, they're good men and women up there, but boy, there are times when I marvel at how, at how lacking in compassion and empathy they are. I don't know what to do about that. Most of the people that come here do appreciate the opportunity that we have to come here and rebuild our lives. If I ran a facility that they felt like it was their home and they started to feel stable, that that would change their life. They would start to feel stable. They would start to react to that and start to build something better. The people that I have worked with that have been successful, that have come from the halfway houses, they're our best tenants. They're our best guests. It's kind of funny now because I'll go home and tell my husband that my, some of my very favorite people live in this building who have made some bad choices. We just, as neighbors out there, need to be good neighbors to other people and realize that as we treat people good, they are, are looking for a way to improve their life. And, and in many cases, they may move into your community, may not be the perfect neighbor you are thinking might move in, but they can become the perfect neighbor. If you're accepting of them um, and help them in every way that you can to share, because uh, isn't that why we're, we're here on the earth, is just to help everybody along to get to the same place. Uh, there was a comment from one of their little managers. She said, well, if we changed it for you, we'd have to change it for everybody that's ever applied that has a felony. And, and when I ask them what I can do, all they say is, get it expunged. They won't even consider. They won't consider that I can't do it. I put money into it. Um, I've had lawyers tell me, that it's a waste of time and money. I'm off on a, a new adventure. I'm headed towards, uh, I'm gonna go check out some, try to get some information about some uh, apartments that I've been trying to get into and see if I can get kind of a little bit update on their policies and their changes that I heard that they have made. Now with the felony record, we, um, we're changing a few things, so we are going through some changes. Some, some changes. So, yes. Okay. We are sorry that we missed your call. We thank you for your interest in our property. At the tone, please record your message. Yes, my name is Tanya, and I just was uh, needing to get a little bit of information about your, your property. Uh, there's just a lot of reasons why I wanted uh, so badly to get into these beautiful apartments and to be rejected and be told that I'm basically not worthy because I'm a felon. Entitlement um, is kind of the, the way it seems that our society is going right now and it personally makes me sick to my stomach. About half of our guys are SOs, sex offenders, and half of them are um, from somebody who's killed somebody down to somebody who shoplifted one too many times and just went, went out to prison. I both own and manage as well as uh, manage other properties for guys coming out of the prison system. I was fortunate enough to be introduced to somebody, um, had the funds and the desire to, to buy properties, and so we pulled our resources together, mainly his. We've been doing this for about 10 years. 
Well, I'm a, I'm a former bad guy myself. I spent eight years in prison, so uh, the, the need is very strong. Stable, stable housing is everything. They come home to a stable place around good people, and I'm talking other felons that, are, that want to improve their life, um, then the pressure is off. Uh, they're, they're not getting phone calls from old friends saying, hey, let's go party or do something stupid. Well, once I got my uh, uh, packet back from the uh, Board of Pardons that said had my release date, I started uh, putting feelers out to find housing for different apartment complexes, uh, single little apartments or houses, and turned down one after another, one after another, one after another. And I realized this is going to be a struggle that I might have to go to a halfway house. Uh, but I met a, a gentleman inside who knew Mike, who put me in contact with Mike. And uh, Mike had a place that was coming available by the time I got out. So I put that in and it was approved. If I didn't get the chance or Mike didn't give me the chance, you know, when I got out to find a place to, to, to put me into a place, I might have gone sour. I might still be in a halfway house. So Mike in general, got me started on the path to where I am now. It just keeps me focused on, on helping them, which automatically keeps me um, going down the right, the right path. And so it's, it's been extremely rewarding. A lot of the guys have moved on now. It's been almost 10 years. A lot of the guys are married, have bought homes. This is, this is where it all began right here. This is the first property, you know, what, five years ago? When Five and a half years. Now I bought a house, and now I'm rebuilding the houses full time. Well, if more people were to understand, you know, yeah, we've made all made mistakes, and some of us have done time, but we've been given a second chance, and 99% of us want to make that change. We want to do better. It is true that if you treat people well. The, the majority of people, even people who've been to prison, especially people who've been to prison, they're gonna appreciate that um, and, and want, to, want to show you that they've made changes in their life. Well, recidivism, I guess, first of all, people throw that word out and it can mean several different things. It can mean rearrest. It can be re another conviction. It is certainly a problem. Now, the statistics show that about two-thirds of people, that when, when they're released from prison within three years, they're rearrested. And about one-half of them get sent back to prison. That's pretty high. We should do better than that. In the past, we seem to broad brush stroke a lot of things. We seem to set up this broad parameter that, that just applies to kind of everybody out there. And you either meet this parameter or you don't. I feel like this needs to be much more of an individual thing. 20 years ago, I don't think that blanket housing bans would have caused much of a stir. Um, but you're right, there is an increased awareness of you know, the criminal justice system and the effects that that has on our larger social fabric. This ruling from HUD, this guidance is April 4th, so this is pretty fresh. Okay, We're still trying to digest it and properly interpret it. And the guidance makes clear that blanket bans, whether based on felonies or uh, based on time periods or um, even types of offenses generally are not going to be okay, are going to be unlawful. The driving force behind this is called disparate impact. This is where a neutral policy, such as you can't rent to felons, well, felons as a group is multiracial, multicultural, multinational origin, multi-sex. African-American and Hispanic individuals are incarcerated at a higher percentage than Caucasian individuals. And so having a no felon policy has a disproportionately negative impact on African-Americans and Hispanics. Fair housing is all about treating everybody what? Fair. Equal the same, but fair housing implementation is all about evaluating them on a case-by-case -case basis. Maria, you asked, how do I get my owners to do this policy? Well, remember, property managers, if your owners don't follow fair housing policies, we.
fire them. And that's the problem that we have, is that you know we want to be able to reject the sex offenders, the and you can. You know, domestic and violence and cases. You can. There still are sex offenders that you definitely don't have to run to, but you also should have just a reasonable um, policy that might state that if someone has been arrested and convicted and has been out of jail for three years, um, then you rent to them. That's, that's a good one. But if you just say never, that could be a problem. Who's going to help my landlord get the meth lab out? I mean, if we take a chance on someone and that happens, these, these well, it's almost criminal call how the police. these laws are. We don't want to overthink this. We don't want to panic. We need to still remember that we have rights as business owners. And as long as we can have a justifiable defense, we're probably going to be OK. If we don't see a lot of lawsuits, it's because we will have seen a lot of voluntary change. However, there are still several municipalities in Utah that have such blanket bans in place. So if we take that good landlord Lord program, and rather than, than painting it with a broad brush, say, hey, come on in and work with us and look, look, let's look at your individual circumstances and commit to following certain things that indicate that you are back on track and doing the right things. And, and some of those things are, are the Real Victory program, being involved in successfully completing day-to-day -day the 24-7 program. Uh, it's, it's working with Cottages of Hope. All of this is wrapped into that individual from my perspective, and so it's an individual thing because that way, there's, there's accountability. I used to get mad, and I still do sometimes, but there's just really no point in it. I, I, I know who I am, I know I'm awesome, I know how hard I've worked to get where I am today. I know everything that I've put into becoming who I am, and fuck everybody else if they don't see it. Somebody's gonna give me a chance one day, and that's all I need. If someone that is really trying to get their life in order and, and get back and get back into society, I mean, do all those things that look really good and are positive and you've been positive for the last couple of years and there hasn't been any problems and it seems like you're on the right track, I think we're hindering society if we don't give people another, another chance because then where do they end up? Either back in jail or on the streets. My kids in particular, they don't understand that, well, daddy's making enough money. Daddy has a good job, but daddy can't get a better place to live. We're stuck in a trailer with no heat. We've had no heat in this trailer since the beginning of winter. Like I was saying, my husband's on probation for a, a felony from 2012 and I was just wondering if if you guys would be willing to rent to us or at least give us a shot at an application um I, I don't I don't like I don't see like uh, how do I say this I you, you definitely can fill out an application that that's wonderful um how do I go about getting an application if, if you just want to text me um, your email address, and I can send you an e uh, one over email. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Well? Stay positive. Stay focused. Um, when one guy tells you no, and the next guy tells you no, the third guy might say yeah. Or it might take 10 guys, but eventually you will find a place, but you just got to stay positive and focused. Welcome to the Ogden City City Council meeting. It is the 3.30 p.m. joint work session. They just want uh, our program not to have a felony exclusion. So we don't have a felony. But that was the whole premise of doing this from it the beginning. Was was a compromise. It's a pilot program. We can give waivers all we want, but they still have to convince and find places that will rent to them. The ACLU would like the felony exclusion to be removed from any good landlord city. I don't think that will happen. I hope not. I know Senator uh, Representative King is a Democrat from the Salt Lake area, has opened a bill file. Um, he, he does a lot of the bills for the ACLU. 
Sometimes people get confused and think that what we're looking for is to force landlords to rent to people with criminal convictions. The ACLU is a civil liberties group. We would never force private property owners. We just want cities to get out of the business of forcing landlords to discriminate against this group of people. One of the things that I think the felony exclusion leads to and that I'm concerned about in terms of the communities that we're talking about, you have greater likelihood of uh, segregation. It leads to, or it can lead to, a ghettoization of communities in a way that I think is harmful. Representative King. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Colleagues, this is an important bill when we're talking about such fundamental things as uh, private property rights. It's an important bill when you're talking about such things as giving people a new chance, a free chance, a good chance once they've paid their debt to society to try and get back up on their feet. They are already stigmatized as a population. We already allow landlords to uh, refuse to lease to these folks, and that happens over and over and over again. So, Further discussion to the bill? Representative Potter. Thanks, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Um, I appreciate the sponsor's intent with this bill, and I understand what he's trying to do. However, the problem with this bill lies with what it says in line 12. That is, this bill prohibits a municipality. Um, I, I think this is a, well, I know this is a problem for the local governments. This is a problem for the cities to deal with, and it's something that they, they will deal with, and it's something that we as a state should not take away from them. That's uh, my feeling, and I would vote against this. Thank you, Representative. Further discussion to the bill? Representative Ellison. I, I stand in strong, rising strong support of this bill as a co-sponsor of the bill. I wear different hats as I speak about this. I'm a landlord. According to some cities, I'm not a good landlord because I choose to give some people a second chance. I recently rented to uh, an individual, a family, who had gotten out of drug treatment. They've been fantastic tenants. I rented to somebody who had come out of a sex offender program. Excellent tenant. And I also stand in support of this bill as a strong advocate for the homeless. I spent part of my morning trying to work on issues surrounding homelessness, and it's like we're hitting the gas and the brake at the same time. We're saying we've got to solve the homeless problem. Oh, but don't rent to the people who are often homeless because of poor past decisions that are trying to turn their life around. Don't put them in my city. Let's put them in a different city. Let's just keep them in a shelter. I think it's extremely duplicitous for us to say that somebody who's paid their debt to society and wants to step back into our community, well, we're just going to have you do that in certain places, and we're going to penalize the private property owners that want to give these people a break. How is it uh, living here with your dad? How kind of? Well, I mean, it's nice. Like, it sucks. I'm 33 and I live with my dad. You know, um, but I have my own apartment downstairs, so it's not quite so much like I live with him. But it still sucks. I'd like to be on my own, living in my own place. I feel like that's how it's supposed to be done. You know, I'm a mom, and this is not where I saw myself at 33 when I was younger. I think she would like to be on her own, independent, uh, with Grandpa close, but not literally right on top. Mom is cleaning up your stuff, bud. I love him, but we fight. <laughs> we bicker, we're exactly like. So we argue about absolutely everything. Mary would get very frustrated. You know, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And turn down and turn down and turn down. And that builds over time. She covered the newspapers. Uh, she looked for ads on boards here and there. And if we found one, we would go just drive past it to see if it looked like a decent place, place that she might want to be, somewhere near a bus stop, so on and so forth. And in 
every case when she went down to talk about applying uh, and revealed that she had a felony. No matter how long ago, they told her, no, we can't do it. It's like being turned down for job after job after job. The frustration uh, comes out, it gets worse, uh, and it's very hard to watch if it's one of your kids. I'm not going to uh, let uh, negative thoughts intrude on my ability to um, to live life to its fullest. I, ha I have a new zest for life uh, uh, since coming out of prison. The prison was a transformative experience. It's true, I shouldn't have been doing drugs. I shouldn't, you know, I should have been at home that night. I should have taken care of my warrant. As, as former people who've made bad choices and gone to prison, we understand now the importance of, of, of our laws and all that kind of thing. And what we want uh, what the guys want, what I want for them, is just to be given opportunities, like anybody else, to come back um, and prove themselves. And the vast majority of people will do that. I liken it a little bit, if you think back to World War, I mean, excuse me, Vietnam, and when the veterans returned home and they were ostracized and they were criticized and they were excluded, and a lot of them simply went into hiding or they found jobs in places that they could be remote in the oil fields or places that they didn't have to interact with society. The same thing can happen in terms of being a felon in society and trying to reintegrate. I feel like, I've said this several times, that when a felon leaves a halfway house, that's when a sentence really starts. You know, where do I get work? Where can I get housing? So I think I would tell landlords to be educated, to know that there are so many felons that are in halfway houses now that they're already working and they have money, they have de the deposit, they are ready to move in, they're ready to move on with their life. I don't wanna say I'm a prime example, but I am a good example of what can happen when you stay positive and when you surround yourself with awesome people. You're given the chance, take that chance and, and go with it. You, you made some bad choices and so you did some time and society said, okay, we're gonna let you go out there again, try it again. Take that and, and, and run with it. Because behind the bars is not a cool place. Nobody needs to be behind there.